Hello everybody, welcome to number 27, I'm Jack, and today I'm going to do a little bit of a different review of this 500e or e500, whatever you prefer. So what I'm thinking is, the Audi RS2 for example, for me is definitely very much a Porsche Audi because of the technical content in that. With this one, I'm not yet 100% sure, but we're going to talk about the history, we're going to talk about the technical specs, and then lastly I'm going to take it for a drive and see, does it drive like a very quick Merc? Or can you really feel that Porsche influence? And then we'll just try and make up our minds. Um, and in, I'm in no way, these are brilliant cars. I have driven one before, so that's not where I'm going. I'm just interested in whether the hype about how much Porsche is involved is actually justified with this car. So we'll see. So first of all, there is one interesting tidbit that I want to give you and that is about the origins of the 500e, and that is why was it built in the first place? How did the development of this car come about? And many people think that the reason it was made was simply as a counter to the BMW M cars, but there is another theory out there as well. And that is that it was the Lexus LS400 that was responsible for this car coming about. Why is that? Well, because in the US, when the Lexus came out, it made the Germans really deeply worried. It was a V8, it was incredibly refined, and yet it cost less than one of these W124s with a normal three liter engine. So they really felt like they had to have something to work against the Lexus. Now I know this one, the 500E is a five liter, but with shorter con rods, they were able to change that to a four liter. So as well as this, there is a much lesser well-known, and I think it was only sold in the US, four liter version. Uh, of this car and that was supposed to counter the incredible LS400. I'm not sure it was that successful. Now what happened at the time was that Porsche was desperately in need of money and Mercedes wanted to develop a new car. However, they were really busy developing at the time the 140 so they didn't have enough capacity to work on this. It hadn't been designed for a V8, only the small inline sixes so it wasn't going to be a straightforward swap. They initially approached AMG, who at the time were already putting V8s in these, the hammers I think they were called, uh, or colloquially called the hammers, but they were, they were great cars, but AMG didn't have the production capacity that Mercedes wanted. They wanted to be able to produce between 10 and 20 cars a day, which AMG weren't going to be able to fulfill. It was then, by the way, still independent of Mercedes. So Mercedes approached Porsche, and this is where the story all began. Now, Porsche did a lot of the engineering, or most of the engineering on this, and we'll talk about this a bit later, but another kind of interesting thing is the build process was just crazy because Mercedes supplied Porsche, first of all, with the parts and sent them off to Porsche so they could build up the chassis. The chassis then went back to Mercedes to be painted. It then came back to Porsche one more time when they fitted the engine and then went back to Mercedes for final checks. So it was literally back and forth four times, which is pretty crazy. Now back in those days though, it was pretty normal for manufacturers to subcontract designs like that. I think it's less, it, it happens less frequently now. So if we're comparing this to, the, uh, to its biggest rival, the BMW M M5 of the time, there are some quite interesting stats. In terms of power, they were very, very similar. This produced 340 horsepower and the M5 with a 3.9 litre as opposed to the 5 litre, 330. However, you can see the difference is really in the torque figures because this in comparison was a bit of a monster. Incredibly though, the E500 was actually $80,000. That makes it $20,000 or 25% more expensive than the BMW M5. It was an incredibly expensive thing. You can see why I described the production process to you, so that's partly the reason really. It's when we get to the technical side of things though that I'm quite interested to try and explore whether this is really a Porsche Mercedes or whether the Porsche influence is a bit more minimal than we all think. Why is that? Okay, well if we look at the Audi RS2, Porsche Audi RS2, 
there are several things about that car that were engineered by Porsche, but also with some Porsche parts. So for example, the brakes, um, the engine was really comprehensively reworked by Porsche. So it had a different turbocharger, a different intercooler, different cams. And it had some genuine Porsche parts. It had cup wheels, it had the cup mirrors. In short, not only did they produce a car that Audi wanted, but it had some real sort of Porsche bits in it. This, on the other hand, feels a bit more like you could say it was developed by Porsche, but doesn't have enough of that Porsche influence. The reason why I say that is all the parts that Porsche put on this car were off the shelf Mercedes. They weren't modified in any way. Mercedes had the M119 engine, which had just come out for the SL, and that was what was slotted in here. They also used the uprated suspension from the same car at the front. I think the steering knuckles were upgraded from that and an upgraded subframe carrier. And I'm not minimizing Porsche's contribution because they did really do a lot. They did practically all the engineering. I think Mercedes were only responsible for the aerodynamics and for the looks of the car. So although it's hard to find direct input on this, I would say that Porsche, it sounds like Porsche were also responsible for working out the sort of stiffness of the suspension, the geometry, and how the car drove. So I guess in that way you could say, well, yes, it really is very much a Porsche. But I'm just not convinced because it drives every inch like a Mercedes, an RS2, really doesn't it? It drove like something utterly different from anything else that Audi had produced at the time. This doesn't. Now, is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. It has bucket loads of power. It really it is such a, a muscular car, and it, but it is so refined and that's where I'm saying the Mercedes bit comes in. It really feels like just a very quick W124. It doesn't feel different. It's no sharper than a well-sorted 124. Not really, I guess it doesn't lean quite as much in corners, but it certainly isn't a stiff car. You don't get any more feel out of the steering. If anything, there's less feel on this. Don't know why, but there's less feel on this than on mine, on my horrible little Bismarck. Well, it's not horrible, but the little Bismarck there's less fuel coming through the steering. You can still get a little bit through. It's perhaps because of the extra weight up front means that there's more, you know, there's more assistance possibly, uh, or the thicker tires, I don't know. But certainly I get more fuel through the steering on mine, which is odd, can all things considered. So it's quite agile for such a big beast, but you can really feel the weight. So when you come into, say, uh, quite a technical sharp set of corners like this, you'd almost expect it to understeer, but it really doesn't. It resists understeer quite fiercely. Uh, it's not bad at all. It's not, it is fast, but it's so quiet, which is the other thing. So this engine just, it's so muted that you kind of don't get the benefit of it really. And it also takes away, it's so well, insulated, it's so well damped, the whole car is doing its very best to convince you that it's not a fast thing until you look down at the speedo and realize the, how fast you're actually going. And for such a big heavy thing, it really does handle really well. There's not Look, that's a really tight corner, but you can power through. There isn't really any understeer, and I wasn't expecting that, you know, on something so big and so comfortable. So, all in all, what shall we, what's the conclusion? I mean, no matter how it was painted, it is simply not, in my view anyway, it's not a sports saloon. The, a BMW M5 would run rings around it in terms of driver feel, satisfaction. Um, this really does feel like a very quick, very well resolved W124, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but again, this is why I sort of have this thing about this. Is it really a Porsche Mercedes or, or not? You know, how big is the Porsche input? I think the Porsche input 
is massive because they really designed, they did practically everything on this. But it was done very much with an eye to keeping Porsche out of the feel of the 500e. It doesn't in any way feel to me like a, a sports car, really. Uh, it handles very tidily. It's amazing what it does for its size. It's fast, but it's a luxury express. It doesn't have many of the makings of what I would call a sports car. They look fantastic though. They do look mean and meaty with those sort of flared arches, which are the reason why they couldn't have them on the standard Mercedes production line. So Porsche actually had to move the suspension pickup points further out in order to fit in the engine. To be honest, I've never been a gigantic fan of the M5 series of cars anyway, because I think they're just too big to be proper sports cars anyway. Um, so yes, you can make them handle, you can make them sharp, but really their intended purpose is to go from A to B quickly, comfortably, and in that way, this is more successful because you don't get the compromises that you do in the constant sort of little edge that you would get in an M5. And this is actually unashamedly a really, just a really quick car, but it is in essence still a big saloon and it's not trying to hide it. And I really like that. But I think Porsche were allowed more leeway with the RS2 to try and put their imprint on it. I think this is very much a Mercedes designed and engineered by Porsche to feel like a Mercedes. Thank you so much to James who brought this down for me. By the way, this is one of the limited versions. So it has 10 millimeters lower ride height. It has Evo wheels. It has a different interior. So they, these are actually quite rare and even more sought after. I don't think it drives that much differently though to a, to a standard one. But Thank you to James. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have a car, particularly an unusual one that you want me to do a video on, then please let me know. And I really look forward to seeing you for the next one.